Um, and uh, my research is my research is an investigation of um, temporal landscape notation, and my concern is to develop uh, notations for landscape architecture uh, from the synthesis of music notation uh, with landscape design. Um, and the purpose is to discover ways in which the temporality of landscape might be better drawn. And um, the title, In an Open Field, comes from the name in Campo Aperto, given to the very beginning of the music notation. And um, for the purposes of my PhD, I kind of set aside Nelson Goodman's rather rigid um, requirements for a notational system to prevent ambiguity of symbols and to ensure compliance between different performances. And instead, I'm referring to the more open possibilities, I hope, that are inherent in the composer Ferruccio Brizzoni's definition uh, that the notation is itself a transcription of an abstract idea. And um, uh, in my professional life, I'm a landscape architect, and I designed a project on the right of Nikoto and Borisaka. Um, we drew inspiration from the uh, landscape of the Silver Pavilion in Kyoto and the way in which incidental changes in materiality create space. And of course, when we spoke about uh, material qualities, um, we were thinking of their visual ones. Um, but actually, we were quite surprised by what happened, that people walking on the uh, aluminium bridge caused echoes on the surface um, of the pool. People ran and cycled through the shallow water. And in spring, um, you could even hear the sound of great myrtle blossoms popping into the water. So in fact, sound uh, was the material of the project. And um, I'm fascinated in a way that um, at the beginning um, of the, uh, an idea of landscape that developed in the 18th century that somehow has become codified as a unit of visual space. But um, William Gilpin, uh, writing in 1772, says this, uh, too often the road will appear to dive into some dark abyss, a cataract roaring at the bottom, while the uh, mountain torrents on every side rush down the hills in notes of various cadences as the quantities of water brought the sound fuller or fainter to the ear. Um, in addition to Gilpin, um, William Kent designed a temple of echoes, um, a Rauscham Gardens in Oxfordshire to catch the sounds in a bend in the River Cherwell. And um, uh, Alexander Pope in 1724 wrote to Martha Blount describing the landscape at uh, Sherborne as losing your eyes upon the glimmering of the waters under the wood and your ears in the constant dashing of the waves. So all of them um, recognize the auditory component of the landscape. And currently my research addresses the silent aporia in landscape discourse, the missing element of sound in landscape, how it can be notated, and actually what landscape might be created from this. And this is what I would like to explore very briefly in today's presentation in three sequential notations. In other words, in three drawings of time. The first is an analytical notation of a musical score by the British composer Michael Finnessy called Green Meadows. The second is a descriptive notation of the sounds of 655 seconds of an Australian landscape. Um, and lastly, a prescriptive notation, in other words, a composition for a new landscape created from sound. Um, and uh, this um, So this is the first of the notations.
between two lines on the stage and what we see, but if we could equal a lot of the I thought that's a useful reminder for somebody trying to develop a new language. And um, Michael's score, I mean, it made the music here on the musical sound like it, but it actually builds on a very long uh, history of landscape-inspired music in England, um, either referencing a pastoral scene or as a setting for music where the landscape is idealized and imagined as in view of Paris, Jerusalem. So Green Meadows makes reference to both of these traditions. It explores in musical sounds the notions of a particular English landscape and uses distinctive notational strategies to achieve it. And um, this uh, uh, notation um, analyzed three of those strategies. Uh, first, how is time notated? And um, rather than a kind of metronomic tempo, instead, um, Michael uses words. So the score starts above the horizontal line in the upper left. It says, unsettled, violent, and restless. And it goes through a number of other movements from non from much calmer to non proper presto, and ends finally um, in even slower, all those motions. And secondly, um, um, secondly um, he notates um, time um, in a very different way. And you can see there's, unfortunately, I think this all might be frozen, but anyway, there are a series of cells across the bottom of the screen. Um, and so what Michael does is he creates a tension between the right and left hand of the piano. There are microscopic changes in time that create a kind of rupture, a kind of physical disturbance into the flow of time. And thirdly, um, is there a spatial quality to this music? And if so, how is that drawn? And uh, Murray Schaefer, who wrote Soundscape in 1973, says this, that the exaggerated dynamic plane of Western music allows the composer metaphorically to move sound um, anywhere from the distant horizon to the immediate foreground. The real space of the concert hall um, is extended in the virtual space of dynamics. And in the case of Green Meadows, um, Michael expands the conventional eight degrees that separate pianissimo from fortissimo to a range of actually 15 divisions, from pianissimo to eight F's, which I won't just go out for you to find this phrase. Um, and so that's um, the first of the notations. And the second one, which I hope will play, um, is this, which is the, sorry, um, which is um, the sounds, the transcription of the sounds of the Uruguay National Park, which is in southern Queensland, in Australia. And it's examining whether notation, um, whether, sorry, the notation of sound as music might also allow us to draw sound as landscape, with the inevitable necessity to include non diatonic tones of any period of time. And I looked at ethnomusicology, and particularly the writings of Mantle Hood, who in 1971 proposed starting with what he termed the Hickian's solution, which is adding diacritical amendments to supplement the existing language with graphic displays of new symbols um, to allow uh, the desired parameters um, to be um, And this notation focuses on this. And um, the three of the parameters of sound are um, notated in music. I think we can defer, uh, in aspects, we can defer to music. So uh, words to describe timbre, um, uh, uh, dynamic markings. And actually, pitch is not that important, perhaps, in landscape where pitch juxtapositions are unrelated and um, where the, um, uh, and are relatively short in duration. So the greatest challenge really is about the notation of time. And um, for this, I use um, an idea that was developed in the 1960s by Dieter Christensen and Bruno Mendel um, in response to the difficulties of measuring a tempo without metronomic notions of time. And they called it um, inner tempo, which they calculated as the average um, of rhythmic movement um, to its total duration. Is it moving? Is it can you, can you see? No, no. <coughs> Films play that doesn't appear to be. But I might just escape. Let's just see. It's a shame to not have the film focus as the musician. Let's try again. Perhaps the cross will be on us. Can you open them on the machine or on the game? No, 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 they're on the game. They're in the machine. Yeah, they're in the machine. 
may well do as well. So sorry to take too much time. It's, you know, rather, rather troublesome. But anyway, um, I'll have to carry on. With you. So um, what I would say is that, um, um, sorry, I'm uh, okay. So the drawings of the films, um, of each of the films in charcoal, sorry, are actually filmed to form the notation. Uh, so like a design landscape, um, they contain both construction and demolition. And as information accrues, erasure becomes necessary in order to accommodate subsequent transcriptions. And that means that this causes constant choices about which material to retain and which material is discarded. And like a landscape, the notations reveal not just lines of current activity, but past paths and um, places visited. And this is a kind of summary sheet of some of the new symbols that we um, And then um, lastly, um, there's a third. Perhaps afterwards you, know, you can have a wander around the exhibition outside where the films are moving, but can borrow it. Thanks, <laughs> um, And then the last of the experiments was this kind of compositional phase. So what might be how might we compose an auditory landscape? And so I use these ideas of volume and sound quality, sound directionality, sounds and silences, density of sounds, in other words, in the tempo, in order to construct that. And um, I'll now play another film which to you and you'll also um, uh, uh, won't work. Um, but anyway, I used 170 hours of field um, recordings um, uh, to create kind of five territories which are um, unsettled menacing, spacious, still, and um, restless. I can see that they're not moving really here. Um, but I'll go around. Um, so I think that this ability um, to draw, describe, and construct landscape through sound um, actually connects us to the spatiality, uh, temporality, and materiality of landscape in entirely different ways from the vision. Firstly, the scale of the auditory landscape often extends beyond that of vision. So what we call the acoustic horizon, and Murray Schaefer again says that hearing is a way of touching at a distance. Um, secondly, um, hearing is orders of magnitude more sensitive to temporal changes and very less alert in space and speed, but in a very real sense, sound is time. Um, thirdly, unlike light, uh, sound waves traverse the space with perceptible speed. As either echoes or reverberation, the sounds of the past is concurrently with the sounds of the present. And lastly, of course, there's a duality um, to sound and material. That through reverberation and reflection, sound qualities, sorry, sound reveals qualities of materials beyond the superficial and actually connect us to their substantive properties. And uh, Jonathan Hill, writing in Immaterial Architecture in 2006, said that sound is material and it can be heard. It's immaterial and it cannot be seen except through its consequences. So is a landscape being created? Um, through um, um, these uh, notations. Um, so this is a, um, a score by the English composer Cornelius Cardew, um, who, writing in Tempo magazine in 1961, rather famously said that notation and composition are determined each other. And I'm interested in these block drawings by Alexander Cousins from 1785. And they were published in his new method of assisting the invention in drawing original compositions of landscape, and they were made from smudges of ink. And the accidental shapes me, would suggest natural features that he then elaborated and painted over. So rather than drawings of actual places, cousins' landscapes were invented compositions, devoid of people, they provoked personal responses in the view. And I hope that the abstract quality of my notations will also allow us to conceive landscapes through them. And I'll try one more time if you don't mind. There we are. And um, while I was um, uh, uh, filming the developing notations, um, hopefully, uh, you'll see that suddenly light uh, was cast uh, through an adjacent window um, onto the drawings. And it reminded me of Turner's painting of the Tate of Snowstorm, Hannibal is Army, crossing the Rivers. Um, Ruskin writing in Modern Painters says of Turner that first he receives a true impression from the place itself, and then he sets himself as far as possible to reproduce that impression in the mind of the spectator. My films also seek to convey the experience within the Australian landscape, the absence of a visual uh, focus, almost imperceptible motion, or, yes, and um, in, in the dominance of sounds. Um, the very first Oxford English Dictionary a reference to landscape was in fact in 1603, and it was defined as a picture 
representing natural inland scenery. So landscapes are formed through creating the same experience of a place but through another media. If representation of a place through painting can be landscape, then why not notation? So like the work of Cousins and Turner, these notations recreate in the mind of the observer the real impressions of the place. Intriguingly for me, so what started out as a study um, through drawing of landscape has in fact ended up creating 